What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers. DJ Bucky back with you. And, uh, Buck, we're going to get a chance to talk some college kids. Um, got a chance to watch some of these young offensive linemen we could be looking at in the draft. So we're going to get to that in a little bit. Uh, we've got some other topics we want to hit, including how offensive lines were built for the division leaders. But uh, once again, we've been given a gift. We have a trade right before we get ready to start the show. So we can jump right in on that, as well as a trade that happened uh, the day before. But let's get to it right now. Kadarius Toney is traded from the New York Giants, where as a former first-round pick, a recent first-round pick, uh, hadn't found success. The Kansas City Chiefs, they make the move. They trade a third and a sixth to the Giants for Kadarius Toney. So what's your, what's your immediate reaction on this one? Uh, immediate reaction from the Kansas City Chiefs, this is exactly what they needed in terms of the style of player that they're getting in Kadarius Toney. They needed more speed on the perimeter. They needed someone that could do some of the stuff that has been lacking since Tyreek Hill departed. Kadarius Toney is a big time playmaker. Well, he was coming out of Florida. He has outstanding stop start quickness and burst. He has the ability when engaged to be a vertical threat. This was the part that was missing in the Kansas City Chiefs offense. To get him for a conditional third and a sixth round pick, to me, is a perfect value for them and with Andy Reid because people are talking about, A, are you worried about maybe the missteps that he had with the Giants in terms of maybe some of the football character stuff not jobbing there? Andy Reid has proven time and time again he and the culture that has existed and been built in Kansas City finds a way for these guys to kind of navigate the path and have success on the field. I'm willing to bank on Andy Reid finding a way to make Kadarius Toney a very productive player in this offense. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this is to form for everybody involved here. When you look at these teams that, that have made these trades, and we're going to get to the uh, Robert Quinn trade to the Philadelphia Eagles in just a moment. But let's let's talk about the Kansas City Chiefs, as, as you just mentioned. This is Andy Reid, who, when Deshaun Jackson was coming out of college, we all knew how talented he was, but there was some questions, you know, okay, maybe just not the cleanest – uh, of guys when you think about oh, okay you know maybe there were some work ethic questions about him coming out attitude you remember there was all those murmurings about his attitude coming out it worked to in mm -hmm. a big time way uh, with the Philadelphia Eagles Tyreek Hill we all know the issues that he had um, was off a lot of teams boards and then Andy Reid brings him into Kansas City and they have a lot of success together now everybody's issues are different but Kadarius Tony a little disinterested uh, there with the Giants there were questions about his attitude the production obviously was non-existent. Um, so this is kind of the, the type of guy Andy Reid's had success with over the years, being able to take him into their culture and they were able to get the best out of him. So I think it makes sense from their standpoint. Um, I look at it, though, from the opposite side, and I think about our buddy Joe Shane and where he came from with another one of uh, our buddies mm -hmm. in, in Brandon Bean. And think about where they were in the building process. We've already talked about you know, the comparisons with Josh mm -hmm. Allen and Daniel Jones and how you try and get the most of them and how they're, you know, Brian Dayball is utilizing Daniel Jones similarly to when the way they play with Josh Allen early on. Think back to this, Buck. Remember that Sammy Watkins? They hadn't picked him, but he was a high pick of the previous regime. Mm -hmm. And then they ended up trading him. Brandon Bean trades him to the Rams for a second and a sixth and a player. Now you have Joe going to the Giants and in the same building process has said, okay, former first round pick doesn't really fit what we want to do going forward. Instead of a second and a six, you get a third and a six, uh, which is a pretty good haul from what Kadarius Tony has shown thus far. So the question that I have for you then is what's next? Because we saw in the building process with the Bills, it was the trade for Stephon Diggs. All this stuff kind of set that up to go get mm -hmm. your quarterback a weapon. I got to believe that maybe it's not this trade deadline, but in the offseason, you're going to see the Giants be aggressive with some of these extra picks and go get a big-time weapon as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is on the horizon. And I do believe uh, the Giants have been emboldened to make these moves because they've been successful with their kind of guys, meaning guys that are about it, guys that really come to work and have bought into what Brian Dayball and this Giants team has created from a cultural standpoint. So if Kadarius Tony didn't fit and wasn't productive you have to get him out and you just have to look call it what it is he doesn't fit what we want let's see how much we can get back and then we'll use those assets to find an experienced player that can give us what we want on the perimeter because when we think about daniel jones and if we're beginning to buy into what daniel jones is bringing to the table for the giants particularly in the building well let's give him a full chance to be successful 
an experienced player, a proven guy that can make plays, yeah, I think they certainly have their eye towards free agency or maybe bringing somebody back to the organization that could give them that pop. And the only reason why I say bringing it back, because I do know OBJ is kind of hanging out there in the balance. And I wonder <laughs> if maybe, just maybe, they kind of want to bring it back and run it back because he did have a lot of success with the Giants in his formative years. Yeah, I just think it's important. I think anytime you analyze a trade, it's important as an organization to know where you are and where you want to go. Um, the Kansas City Chiefs right now are in, you know, hunting for a Super Bowl mode. They're right there. They might be the best team in the league right now. Uh, they're in that mix. So be bold, be aggressive, and let's try and supplement our roster here and bring in some guys. And maybe it's a little bit of a risk there. But again, they've had success uh, with similar type players in the past. So they know where they are. They're aggressive. The Giants, you know, knowing where they are, even though they sit here with only one loss, they're having a great season. They know what kind of culture they're trying to build. They know mm -hmm. what they're after and, and who they're going to be. So I think this is about setting up that next move that they can make. And they weren't getting anything out of Kadarius Tony right now anyway. So uh, I thought it made a lot mm. of sense for both of those teams. Now, another trade that just took place the day before, Howie Roseman, the Philadelphia Eagles, they go out and get Robert Quinn uh, from the Chicago Bears. The Bears coming off a, uh, a big win over the New England Patriots. But, Buck, I don't know if you're with me on this. Again, this points to you know, Ryan Poles knowing where they are in their building process mm -hmm. and Howie Roseman knowing that the time is now. You know, it, it, look, it, it speaks to the identity of both participants in the deal. Ryan Poles wants to rebuild the team. Uh, in a very organic way. Homegrown products, and you have to have draft access to be able to do that. Robert Quinn had given the Bears outstanding production the previous year, was having a bit of a slow start this year. Like, it's fine. He still is a very, very solid pass rusher. But for the Philadelphia Eagles, as you've always talked to me, it's always been about the trenches. And what the Eagles have done when they've been at their most successful is they beat you with waves of defenders, waves of trench warriors, on offense and defense. When they won the Super Bowl, they could go eight, nine deep of guys who could play. And so to me, Robert Quinn is very similar to where Chris Long was at that stage of his career when they went to the Super Bowl. A guy who can give you some flash moments and maybe those flash moments don't happen until the playoffs. But man, when you have a deep and talented rotation and you have a mix of young and old, it gives you an opportunity to keep fresh bodies on the field to wear down the opponent. And that is important, not only in dealing with injuries down the stretch, but in dealing with the urgency and the intensity of the playoffs. You need a lot of bodies that can play fresh, give you maximum effort to wear down the opponent. I believe in the formula. I think the Eagles are right on track. Yeah, and I also like this aspect of it. And uh, and talking to one of my buddies in another sport, he talked about the trade deadline and how one of the things they always tried to accomplish was you wanted to bring in a productive veteran leader who hasn't won the ultimate prize because now you have the hunger and he can kind of speak to the urgency for the rest of the mm -hmm. group. I and mean, Robert Quinn's been in this league a long time, doesn't have a ring. He's got a chance to go chase one right now. On a, on a team with the Eagles, it ha yeah, they have a couple guys. They have a few guys that were on that Super Bowl team, but a lot of younger guys playing key roles for them. And now you bring in another veteran mm -hmm. who is starving for a championship. He's going to be able to relay that message to those young guys. And as you mentioned, just keeping everybody fresh. It's a, it's a long season. It's a 17-game season plus the postseason. They don't need his best next week, Buck. They need his best once they get in the tournament. You know, going all the way back to when I played for uh, Hall of Fame executive Ron Wood for the Green Bay Packers, one move that he would always make uh, at the near the end of every season, he would find a veteran to come in to not only bring some production that you might need in a pinch, but also some veteran leadership when it comes to making that playoff push, making that run. And so there is value to bringing in, I would call the old head. The old guy that can maybe charge it up because he can be the old, the wise old man in the room talking about the importance of taking care of business now. And the fact that Robert Quinn has not run a wing. He's not won a ring. I got a little tongue twister there. Uh, but he's able to uh, <laughs> talk about the urgency and the competitive nature that is needed to be able to get over the top. Yeah, you want a locker room full of motivated players that are all chasing the ultimate prize. Quinn is one who also brings outstanding pass rush ability. 
Yeah, and, you know, look, from his standpoint, he's only got one sack this year. You mentioned it last year, 18 and a half sacks. Uh, so it's a slow start through seven games. But keep in mind, he's not only going to be re-energized because he's going to a good football team, he's going to get more opportunities to rush the quarterback because this is a team in Philadelphia that's, mm-hmm. that's undefeated for a reason. They're playing with leads, uh, and they're going to be playing with a lot of leads going forward. So he's going to get a chance. Doesn't have to play a ton of snaps. Get him in on some third downs, obvious passing situations. Keep him fresh, but he's going to get a chance to hunt the quarterback. So I thought it made a lot of sense for them. I also think the Bears, you know, good for them. Ryan Poles, it's a big win. I know it's hard to make a move like that when the locker room's up and you saw Roquan Smith's reaction. Uh, just devastated, moved to tears to see his, his teammate move on. But this is not their window mm-hmm. right now. Their window is not open. So it's about trying to get resources for when that window does open. Yeah, and, and, and this is part of the moves that you have to make. Uh, you know, it's the... It's the, the dilemma in the debate sometimes between the head coach and the general manager. The head coach is talking about the here and now. The general manager is thinking down the road. And so this is a move that you make to put your team in the best position to compete down the road. Yes, Robert Quinn could have given them something over the next six to eight weeks. But for this team, you're like, hey, our best days are ahead. Let's make sure we have the war chest stocked with uh, draft capital so we can go and hunt and chase the right way. No doubt. Um, that, is, uh, that is fascinating when you get these trades. I think we'll see a couple more here before the deadline. Uh, I believe it's on November 1st, so right around the corner. Um, and we'll keep you covered on that right here. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, Buck. We're going to come back and talk about how the offensive lines of the first place teams were built. What can we learn from that study? We'll dig into that right after this. All right, Buck, let's jump into these offensive lines. It's always interesting when we're looking at the team building to see how these teams and rosters are constructed. Um, And it's always good, obviously, to look at the teams that are having success. So here we are through seven weeks. We're going to look at the offensive lines of the first place teams. And I was just kind of curious on this, and Nabil did a great job of pulling all this information together, uh, of how, how these offensive lines were assembled for the good teams. So let's jump into it. Let's start here on the AFC. Now, let's start first with the Buffalo Bills. They have two of the five starters acquired via the draft. Those are their tackles and Deion Dawkins, a second rounder, and Spencer Brown, a third rounder. And then you've got a couple free agents in Roger Saffold and Mitch Morse. And then you've got a trade of Ryan Bates, um, who was an uh, undrafted free agent with the Philadelphia Eagles. So kind of a hodgepodge there. I find it interesting that you don't have a homegrown first rounder on a Bills team that might be the best in football. Yeah, it's so unusual because most of their roster uh, has been homegrown. When you look at the rest of the team and the quarterbacks and some of the playmakers, particularly on defense, they're homegrown products. But, you know, we had talked about last year that maybe you didn't necessarily need uh, all first rounders. It was limiting the tomato cans that you have in front of the defense. And so if you can just have a solid offensive line, not necessarily A's, but maybe a bunch of B's uh, across the board, it will give you a chance to win games, particularly if your playmakers and your quarterback are at an A level. And with the Buffalo Bills, they had A level playmakers. No doubt. Yeah, the no tomato can theory definitely applies there. The Ravens, uh, they've got three that were drafted. You've got a, a first round pick in Ronnie Stanley, a fourth rounder in Ben Powers, another first rounder in Linderbaum. And then you've got a couple free agents in Kevin Zeitler and Morgan Moses, veterans. You know, Zeitler obviously was a first-round pick as well, I believe, with the Cincinnati Bengals originally. So you've got three drafted there. Um, I think that's a little bit of a sign there of kind of the identity of that team. It's been a physical team. It's been a line of scrimmage team. They've always wanted to run the football there going back 20 years. In order to do that, Buck, I think you need to have a little bit better uh, than the no tomato can philosophy. You've got to have some guys that can move people. Yeah, and I think that's, that's really true. And I think it's a little different when we talk about uh, this is a team that is built to run the football. And I think when you talk about getting the run game going, it is harder to find, I think, run blockers, guys that have enough reps moving people off the ball, guys with enough of the pedigree necessary to be able to uh, establish the run and kind of beat people in, at a, in an old school fashion. And the Baltimore Ravens have always done this and they have prototypes that they look for, but it also speaks to the way the organization believes in building their team. It is always about the draft for the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah, you supplement it with the free agents, but it's about the draft. And so I am not surprised to see that the majority of their offensive line are homegrown. I'm also not surprised that a lot of these guys have first-round pedigrees, three of them. 
No doubt. Uh, let's go to the Tennessee Titans in a kind of a watered down AFC South right now. When you look at them, you would have had three drafted because you had Taylor Lewan, but he's down for the year with an ACL. Uh, but you got two other draft picks, and Dylan Raiden's the right guard and the right tackle. Uh, Nicholas Petit Freer, those are second and third round picks. Then you've got a uh, undrafted free agent, Aaron Brewer. You've got Ben Jones, who was a free agent in 2016. And you've got Dennis Bailey, who was acquired in a trade uh, from Carolina. So it would have been, I think, similar to the Ravens in that it's a line of scrimmage team. And if you have your, your regular left tackle healthy, that's three drafted guys um, showing kind of a uh, importance placed on acquiring and developing those guys uh, in the draft. Yeah, no, but you know, I, th I think also when we talk about the offensive line, it also speaks to maybe some of the, I would say the, the blah feel that you get from the Titans offense. Like they've won a lot of games, but I don't know if you necessarily view them as a powerhouse in any way, shape or form. And so some of that is just kind of like the hodgepodge and collection of guys that they have in front. Good enough to win, particularly when you have a beast behind you in Derrick Henry, but you do wonder how good could they be if they were a little better at the offensive line. Yeah, no, I, I, that's a fair point. Uh, we get to the Kansas City Chiefs. You've got the uh, left tackle, Orlando Brown. Obviously, a big trade with Baltimore was a first-round uh, swap there. Uh, Joe Tooney, high, high-priced free agent. Creed Humphrey, second-round pick, who's been outstanding, a home run in that same draft. Trey Smith was uh, drafted in the fifth round, although probably would have been a first- mm -hmm. or second-round pick if not for some lingering health issues. And then you have Andrew Wiley, who was uh, a free agent there in 2018 at right tackle. So that left side of the line is pretty expensive in terms of draft capital uh, or free agent money. Uh, so you've got the draft pick in Humphrey, mm -hmm. the big money free agent Tooney, and you trade a first round pick for Orlando Brown. I definitely think you can see it's a priority there in Kansas City. Yeah, it absolutely is a priority, but you know why it's a priority? Because the quarterback is a priority. When you pay the quarterback, however much money they paid him on that monster deal, you want to make sure that he is protected. And so you spend a little more capital to make sure that he is always able to throw from it a, a clean pocket. And so that's what the Kansas City Chiefs have done. And because they are a team that knows that as long as they have a quarterback, they have a chance. That is why they've invested so heavily in that offensive line. Yeah, and I think it's interesting um, when you look at Tyreek Hill and that money they could have had for him. I think you can look at that money being poured mm -hmm. into the offensive line. Uh, to me, I think that's where that went. And then you go out and you get a Kadarius Tony on the cheap uh, to go along with some other rel you know, relatively uh, team-friendly deals that they did at the wide receiver position with Juju Smith-Schuster and MBS. So uh, I definitely think you could see the priority they placed there on the offensive line. We get over to the NFC, Buck. We can go through these quickly. But I just want to kind of get through the, the theme mm -hmm. here. The Philadelphia Eagles, entire offensive line was drafted. Um, you're looking at a seventh-round pick in Mylotta, second-round pick in Landon Dickerson. Kelsey was a six. Samalo was a third. Lane Johnson was a first. Another team with all five drafted uh, along their starting offensive line is the Minnesota Vikings. Darasaw was a one. Ezra Cleveland was a two. Bradbury was a one. Mm -hmm. Ed Ingram was a two. Brian O'Neill was a two. So let's start with those two teams. I think it's pretty unique um, that you have two teams, first place teams in their division, with an entirely homegrown offensive line. Yeah, it speaks to the long-term vision of the organization. Draft and develop and resign. Draft your players, develop your players, and then resign your own players. The best teams have a way of being able to cultivate an environment where you always want to be around. They take you, they nurse you, they bring you up to a certain level. They reward you for making the improvements with another contract, and then you stay and you perform at a high level. The Eagles have done that going all the way back for years. They have always sought to not only draft their players, but pay their players and pay their players before anybody else gets paid. And so, uh, yeah, it kind of speaks to their organizational philosophy. And then with the Minnesota Vikings, this is interesting that all of their guys are homegrown because you have a new regime. You have a new regime coming in, and they're looking at the personnel and the people that they have, and they're rocking with what has been established. And so we'll have a better picture of this team in a year or two, but I think it speaks to them also following and adhering to a, a principle of draft, develop, resign, keep your people, because only you intimately know all the information about your people because you drafted them and you developed them. Yeah, and I think they're a little different here. When you look at the Eagles, I think it's, it's look, Coach Stoutland's as good as it gets offensive line coach-wise. 
They know what they want. They know how to evaluate that position very well. They've been aggressive uh, in, in terms of getting guys that were lower picks on the field, developing them, getting them ready to go. When you have a seventh rounder and a sixth rounder and a third rounder as, as three of your starters that are homegrown, that means you're identifying them properly, you're developing them properly, and you got a heck of a coach. Mm -hmm. um, I think all those things are in place. Think about the Philadelphia Eagles, Buck. They have, they have Cam Jurgens, who's just waiting in the wings, uh, who's going to be a solid starter. They have another first-round pick in Andre Dillard, who you could say, well, he hasn't worked out. Well, he got beat out by Jordan Mailata. They, he's another high draft pick that they have uh, in reserve, so they've got yeah. depth there as well. With the Minnesota Vikings, they've taken a lineman in the first two rounds in each of the last five drafts, and those are their starters. They're all first and second yeah. round picks, one in each of the last five drafts. So even though the regimes have changed, it's an organizational philosophy and a commitment to say, hey, one of our first two picks – Every year for a five-year period is going to be an offensive lineman. And I don't think that's a, a mystery that now they find themselves as, as the best team in that division. They've made that a major emphasis. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a major emphasis. We talk about investing in the front line. Uh, look, you are what your draft picks are, meaning uh, you tell us a lot about what you believe in in terms of building a team and how you expand your draft picks. And so the Minnesota Vikings believe in trying to build up the ranks from front to back, meaning they go put the investment in the offensive line because that's the foundation for the offense and let's get it going. And so I kind of dig it. Uh, it's interesting to see these teams, uh, how these teams have been built uh, when you look at the division leaders, particularly at the offensive line. Yeah, the NFC is definitely draft heavy because the last two teams, the Bucks and the Seahawks, each four of their five starters are homegrown. They were drafted. So with the Bucks, you've got Donovan Smith, the second rounder, uh, Godeke was a second rounder last year. Hainsey was a third rounder in 21, and Wirfs was a first rounder in 20. The only non-drafted uh, guy there was Shaq Mason, which was a trade from New England. And then Seattle, you've got the two tackles from this last draft with Lucas and Cross. Uh, Cross a first rounder, Lucas a third rounder. You've got the guards, yeah. which are Damian Lewis and Haynes, a third and fourth rounder. And you've got the center. Uh, who was acquired in free agency in Austin Blythe. But each of those teams, again, four to five. I think it's fascinating. The NFC, I mean, it's, there's only two starting offensive linemen for the division leaders in the NFC who weren't homegrown. Um, mm -hmm. So in an era where you kind of see hodgepodge and how you build things, there's definitely been a commitment and a focus on that. And, Buck, what, what do you say to the, uh, to the benefit of having these guys? Don't, they don't know anything else. Like, they've never been taught anything else. They only know the way that their team does things. Look, man, you eliminate the bad habits. I don't have to retrain you. Now you've grown up in our system. You've been developed in our system. We know exactly what you're doing. And we're going to reward you for your development. Uh, I love the strategy. I think it's a strategy going all the way back to college. Like the best teams are able to take players, develop players, give them better tools so they can perform at a higher level. That's what these teams are attempting to do when they draft, develop, and eventually put their own players on the field. They are attempting to have a level of consistency and also build a blueprint that enables them to be successful over time. That's what every organization wants. You can't win the title every year, but you always want to be in the conversation. And the only way to do that is to have consistent talent available to give you a chance to go after it. Yeah, interesting uh, philosophy there in the trenches. Fun study again. Thanks to Nabil, our producer, for, uh, for getting all that information for us. Okay, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back and, and uh, we're going to look at the Niners and the Rams. What do the Rams have to do to finally beat this Niners team? We're going to take a peek at that as well as talk about some of these top offensive linemen, some top offensive tackles uh, that could be in the upcoming draft class. We'll get to that right after this. The NFL is headed to Germany for the first time. Yeah! And you could get in on the action. We're sending one lucky fan plus three guests to Munich to watch Tom Brady and the Bucks take on DK Metcalf and the Seahawks. Reaching up, making the catch! Winning fans will enjoy a week in Munich that also features a Bayern Munich European football match. No purchase necessary. To enter and for rules, visit NFL.com slash Munich sweepstakes. It's time to show your good side, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers. And Buck, we're looking at a matchup here with the Rams and the 49ers. And this is one 
Uh, look, the Rams will tell you they won the one that mattered in the playoffs in the NFC Championship game on their way to winning a Super Bowl. But, man, it has been uh, all 49ers in the regular season. Seven straight wins. Uh, beat them earlier week four, 24-9. It's been, it's been a game that's just been dominated at the line of scrimmage by the Niners. Well, I mean, that's been the biggest difference. Uh, the difference has been the play of the Niners in the trenches. They've been able to own the Rams at the point of attack, their defensive line against the Rams' offensive line. And we talked about rebuilding the offensive line. When you look at the work that the Rams have on their offensive line, it's been a hodgepodge of just guys. And so when you think about the blue chip talent that the Niners have always coveted and put out there on the defensive line, it's not a surprise. When you have the Nick Bosa's and all the other guys that have played, the Eric Armstead's and those guys that are premier talents, they whoop them at the line of scrimmage. So before we get to the schematics and all that other stuff, normally the Niners are the more physical team, they're the more dominant team in the trenches, and that is why they have owned the series in recent years. Yeah, it's interesting when you, you look at the front that they play too. Um, this is a a 49ers team that plays what they call that jet front uh, with the wide nines and it is penetration, it is getting off the ball, it is explosive. So if you don't have, you know, kind of the athleticism to match up with that, they're going to be on the other side of the line of scrimmage and they're going to do it all day long. If you look at the Jets and the job they've done this year, um, and they're, I think they're top 10-ish in terms of, uh, of yards mm -hmm. per game allowed against the mm -hmm. run. Again, that's that same front. They're doing the same exact thing and it's fascinating to me that in a front where you're thinking penetration, rush the passer at all times, they're able to stop the run on the way to the quarterback just because they're playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage. And in a kind of a too high uh, gap and a half, two gap league right now, um, you're seeing those teams that are aggressive up front with their front four, they're not only getting after the quarterback, they're stopping the run on the way to the quarterback. Yeah, they're stopping the run on the way to the quarterback, but also look at this. Uh, we talk about styles making fights, but we also talk about weight classes. Uh, it's not a coincidence that the Niners are bigger, faster, stronger at the point of attack. And so when we talk about knockback, the knockback comes from the defensive line as opposed to the offensive line of the Rams. And so you're talking about superheroes that they're trotting out uh, at the line of scrimmage. And they're able to not only uh, dominate with their sheer talent and their physical prowess, but they play in a scheme that eliminates the clutter for them. DJ, we talk about it all the time. Simplicity allows you to play fast. And when they play fast, they play free. And when you have all of that other stuff and you add physicality to it, yeah, you're going to have your way against teams that don't have the talent up front and don't have the wherewithal to want to engage in a fist fight in a phone booth. And so this won't change until the Rams' mentality and their personnel changes up front. You can get cute and all that stuff, but the Niners make it where it's a game that is played on their terms and the Rams are just not built to play on the Niners' terms. Yeah, it's, it's completely true. I also think in this one, last week was a little bit of an appetizer for Christian McCaffrey uh, in that offense, in that system. As I mentioned earlier, when you break down the tape, there were opportunities for mm -hmm. Jimmy Garoppolo to use him much more in a passing game where he was uncovered in space. I think that happens in this game. I think this is, uh, this is going to be one of those games where people are going to say, oh, that's why you traded for a running back, because he's not just a running back. It's what McCaffrey can yeah. do. Uh, split out in the slot, split out wide. I think you see that put on display in this game. I think McCaffrey has a big game, and I think they get to eight, Buck. I think this is the eighth one in a row. I don't see the Rams beating these guys, do you? No, 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 I, I, I think so. I think when we look at the way the Niners have won in the past, it's a level of dominance, uh, and I expect them to dominate in the front line. Now, make no mistake, they got whooped last week, and they will be smarting from their loss to the Kansas City Chiefs. I think we see the best version of the Niners show up. That's scary if you're the LA Rams. Yeah, they just caught Mahomes on the wrong day where him and Andy Reid were in lockstep, and they're, it, there's nothing you're going to do. When those guys are on, when they're in the zone, it doesn't matter who you got, what defense you run, you're going to get gashed, and that's what happened. So uh, that'll be one to look forward to, a big divisional matchup, see if the Rams can uh, can – uh, finally pull one off against the 49ers. Uh, all right, let's talk a little draft before we roll out of here. I've got a chance to start digging in and watching some of these tackles. And when you talk to folks around the league, I was trying to get the names of the guys to watch. So I just watched seven or eight guys mm -hmm. uh, that were recommended. And the two that were recommended uh, with the highest recommendation to watch were Peter Skaronsky, a uh, big tackle from Northwestern. Think about the recent success they've had with Rashawn Slater. And then Paris Johnson mm -hmm. at Ohio State. So Skaronsky's a little... He's, 
listed at 6'4", 315. You're going to hear probably the same stuff about length. He doesn't play super long, but, man, he is, he is explosive out of his stance. He can move people in the run game. He's just got a lot of twitch to him. He plays with a lot of urgency. He can kick out and cover up speed. His hands can get a little wide at times, which would give him a little bit of trouble. Uh, but I just love the demeanor, the tenacity, uh, the physicality that he plays with. A really, really good football player. And then when you get to Paris Johnson, I didn't think he was quite as, as uh, consistent. But you've got, he's a little taller. He's listed at 6'6", 310. He's got excellent foot speed. He's got quickness. His issue is just he's a little narrow at times, um, and there's times where he gets bold and pushed back. So that's an area he can improve. If I'm looking at those two guys, I would say Skaronski over Paris Johnson for me early on. And then I'll give you another one that to me belongs up in that discussion, and that is, I'm going to butcher his name, Buck, but Olu Fashanu, the tackle at Penn State, the younger player, oh. listed at 6'6", 308. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure he's not the best one. You know, of the seven or eight that I watched, I gave him as high a grade as I gave Skaronsky. He's flexible. He can redirect easy. He can he can slide and bend. He can recover. Um, he plays with better anchor and better balance than Paris Johnson. So I haven't heard as much about him. He was kind of one of those names that was just kind of thrown in there. But yeah. I do find it interesting. The Big Ten, if you need offensive linemen, you can't go wrong going to the Big Ten. Uh, you can't go wrong. You, look, we didn't even mention the transfer – uh, to Michigan that came from UVA, the center. I don't want to butcher his name, uh, but yeah. he is absolutely dumb. I had a chance to watch Michigan-Penn State game and at the point of attack, I mean, this guy can pull and do everything. So you're right. We talk about the Big Ten and what the Big Ten is able to produce. They have linemen in bunches. And so if you're a team in need of an offensive yep. lineman, look, it's only two conferences that you primarily live at. You live in the SEC because of the talent that they face against. But then the Big Ten is producing A-level talent on the offensive side of the ball in the trenches. Yeah, the fun thing is, you know, I'm kind of going through and just, as we always say, get them in the right neighborhood. Don't worry about the right house early on. Just watch a couple games, put a grade on them, move on to the next guy, and we'll have time to then come back and, and sort through those clusters. Um, but the, the fun thing is, think about all the pass rushers we had in the Big Ten last year. Carl Loftus, Aiden Hutchinson, Ojabo, mm -hmm. you know, all those dudes. It's going to be a fun yeah. exercise after you study this year's tape, circle back and, and watch some of these guys against some of those guys they faced last year, some of those premier rushers. So um, it's going to be a fun cycle. I've heard the general consensus was, ah, tackle, the tackle group is not great. It's down a little bit. That was, those are, you know, of the guys I watched, those three stood out. I think those are three mm -hmm. first-round caliber players. So we'll see as the time goes along. But we'll try and do this a little bit more on the pod, just kind of sprinkle in some of this college stuff as, as we work our way. Uh, through the tape. You ready to crush this read, Buck? Knock it out. NFL Plus is the league's new exclusive video streaming subscription service. NFL Plus has your game day covered with live local and primetime regular season and postseason games right on your phone or tablet. NFL Plus is available in the NFL app and at NFL.com. Subscription plans start at $4.99 a month. Fans can visit plus.nfl.com and sign up for a free trial of NFL Plus today. Nicely done, Buck. Nicely done. Some of your best work. Uh, reminder, you can find more Move the Sticks content on the NFL's YouTube channel, NFL.com, the NFL channel, and the NFL app. It's been a fun week talking about football, catching up with uh, everything that's going on both in the NFL and in college. We'll be back next week to recap, hopefully, uh, what is a fantastic weekend of action. Uh, we appreciate you listening, and we'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers.